Something's been bugging me lately. Um, fentanyl. Uh, you've heard the word. You've possibly been scared by it. You know, fentanyl has been on a variety of people's tongues in a variety of ways. And um, ultimately, uh, I think a lot of this is a distraction um, from what they're really trying to get us riled up into. When they needed to invade the Middle East for resources, when the military and intelligence industrial complexes needed to invade the Middle East for resources, what did they do? They pushed a campaign for decades to arm, fund, and train terror cells that would eventually become Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, ISIS, ISIL, and the Taliban. They did this, and um, suddenly, right before 9-11, the U.S. government gave the Taliban $53 million so that they could ban opium, so that they could start a war on drugs against opium. The Taliban swore up and down that they was doing it, but they obviously didn't. What the Taliban actually did was they used the existing seized opium as a strategic opium reserve and uh, fucking became a massive exporter of opium, making a, a massive amount of profit. And so Afghanistan became a hub for opium. And then the U.S. government just so happened to have that as another reason to go invade Afghanistan. They had soldiers guarding poppy fields for certain wealthy interests. They had uh, soldiers burning down other poppy fields for strategic interests. And a brutal, bloody war that the U.S. is still not out of Contrary to popular belief, there are private contractors and there are still military actions going on in that region. And I was right about that, by the way, because I predicted that that was going to happen. But basically, uh, they used this as a way to get a conflict going over there. And in the Middle East, suddenly, there was a reason for a significant amount of war. Because not only the Taliban, but all these other factions and all these other people were extremely well-armed and connected. And part of their connections were to Operation Cyclone and subsequent operations to, you know, um, arm, fund, and train uh, other militant groups, not the least of which was Ukrainian nationalists. They're cashing in on that investment, too. But, like, they will directly fund drugs in order to encourage drugs as a reason for continuous involvement in foreign military operations. That's what they'll do. All the fucking time. They did it with the Iran-Contra affair. They did it with Afghanistan. They did it in so many ways, right? The Iran-Contra affair where they funded a drug gang. And then whoopsies, suddenly there's CIA-backed cocaine trafficking into the United States. Whoopsie, we've got an inner-city drug problem that we can leverage for massive amounts more police power and a foreign drug uh, threat that we totally didn't have a part in creating uh, that we can use as a reason for intervention into the political affairs and the socioeconomic conditions of Latin America. You see where I'm going with this? You see where maybe the fentanyl that has been recently linked to massive fentanyl drug rings run by actual cops, that fentanyl might be planted in some way? 
by the U.S. government? Nah, it couldn't be. The U.S. government only did that, like, basically every other time they wanted to scare somebody about a drug. They created the LSD problem <laughs> because they're the ones who popularized it in the 70s. That's what the MK programs were. They created the uh, fucking opium epidemic through big pharma funding and the proliferation of drugs handing them out like candy through corrupt pharmaceutical uh, linked doctors making massive amounts of bank they wouldn't do that with fentanyl now would they well the US is trying to rustle up some jimmies regarding China they're being hawkish they're saying Taiwanese independence and uh we're totally not just using Taiwan as a political puppet for the U.S. in their fucking regime change attempts, because the U.S. is totally not being hawkish on China and would use basically anything to go against them. Not like they just use TikTok and its involvement in China as an excuse to push the Restrict Act, which is exactly what it sounds like it would restrict every internet app and jail a huge amount of people for using the internet fucking normally. I put that out in a video about how the U.S. government is building a digital fence. So the U.S. is trying to be hawkish with China. Well, they're also saying that China is the source of our chips. That if we stop uh if we stop uh doing business with china or we go to war with them we won't have lithium we won't have chips or at least they'll be both much more expensive because china is the one manufacturing our chips china is the chief exporter of lithium for u.s imports um not to mention that but also, um, China is doing investments in Africa that have been spooking Western assets, and they've basically been loaning a bunch of money to South Africans um, and the rest of Africa as well. Uh, and basically, they've been uh, <laughs> they've been making Africa a more friendly place for their business and a less friendly place for. U.S. business. Well, Africa is the chief exporter of cobalt currently. And uh, they are the people the U.S. has to deal with in order to get it, which is why there are a huge amount of unethically treated workers, many of whom are children, suffering for a tiny amount of cobalt for a tiny amount of pay so that you can have high-speed internet and play Angry Birds. Um, so why is all this relevant? Well, maybe because if the U.S. is going to uh, start doing a conflict, doing a heckin' war with people like China, maybe it would serve them to find an alternate source of lithium, to find an alternate source of cobalt, of copper, of all the minerals used to make the technology for their futuristic weapons, for their AI infrastructure, for their everything that they've been needing to build in order to cement their control. And the Middle East has gradually become a less friendly place for U.S. business, allegedly. And uh, the U.S. is being muscled out in the form of the petrodollar slowly being outmoded. Chinese yuan is now being used to buy oil. So the U.S. has to make a strong statement against China. The U.S. has to seem like China will not get away with this. China will not get off of the U.S. leash. So if the U.S. is going to go to war with China, China's obviously going to cut them off in the same way that the U.S. was cut off from Russia because of the sanctions and shit. And that's why the U.S. blew up Nord Stream 2. So, 
all of this leads me to reading something from a paper from brookings.edu. This was in July 2022 by Caitlin Purdy and Rodrigo Castillo, The Future of Mining in Latin America, Critical Minerals and the Global Energy Transition. Now, when they talk about the global energy transition, what they're talking about is transitioning people onto lithium-ion batteries, onto renewable energy, onto things like that. But this paper has interesting things to say about this future. Um, and by the way, remember, I told you that part of the reason they want us all on lithium and all this computer parts and stuff to put in our cars and shit and to put in all of our you know, power boxes, all of our smart everything, is so that they can centrally shut it off if they want to. And so that they can bar you from using your resources, your resources that you sign terms of service about, saying they can be turned off in a hypothetical future. Um, they can cut that off if it's digital, if it's a computer. They can centrally cut it off because they can send a signal to your Tesla telling it what to do. And that's the model for everything. And the reason Elon Musk is now throwing a huge amount at uh, his X AI project. All of this leads me to read this. Latin America holds considerable reserves of critical minerals, sometimes also referred to as future-facing commodities which will be crucial to the global energy transition. What the development of these resources in Latin America will mean for governments and citizens is uncertain. The global energy transition presents an opportunity that could translate into significant commodities windfalls. The end goal for governments is well-regulated mining sector that increases public goods and spurs socioeconomic development with minimized social and environmental impacts. Transparency, accountability, and participation will be crucial to achieving this. However, two major variables could undermine the ability of governments to deliver on this vision. First, most countries in the region face persistent conflicts over natural resource governance, including opposition to mining projects based on environmental impacts, insufficient consultation with affected communities, and inequitable distribution of socioeconomic benefits. I wonder why. Could it be that the U.S. Government, uh, government has shielded U.S. oil companies when they have murdered entire tribes? <coughs> Texaco. Could it be that there's a really bad reputation for U.S. involvement in regime change for Western profit-based interests, no matter how it hurts the local people? <coughs> Pinochet. Um, and so... The second major variability, right? It's I'm skipping some stuff. Um, the second major variable is uncertainty about future demand for the four critical minerals. Demand will depend on factors such as the pace of energy transition and emerging technological developments. For example, identification of replacements for these minerals in key applications or drastic improvements in mineral recycling processes. Not just like dumping them in a foreign country, for instance, that would be nice. And then the U.S. wouldn't be able to have all these Western chauvinist pig fuckers uh, telling us that <laughs> these countries are somehow inferior because they look like waste heaps. Yeah, you fucking made them look like that. So, they say a best case scenario would see critical minerals driving a sustainable development boom in Latin America. Governments would be able to meet significant demand growth with mineral development approaches that mitigate the areas of conflict noted above and better serve citizen needs and priorities. This would also benefit the global energy transition by reducing the risks of supply disruptions and mitigating environmental, social, and governance impacts associated with developing the mineral resources needed for clean energy technologies. So, why am I bringing that up? Introduction. This report from the Levering, Leveraging Transparency to Reduce Corruption Project explores potential scenarios in Latin America for the development of critical minerals, also sometimes referred to as future-facing commodities, considering ongoing conflicts over natural resource governance and uncertain demand. 
It also assesses the extent to which each scenario might lead to an end goal of a well-regulated mining sector that increases public goods and spurs socioeconomic development with minimized social and environmental impacts. Now, the reason I'm reading all of this is because I think you should read this paper because it goes into some detail about what I think they want to intervene in Latin America for now, which is why the paper goes on to say that they've chosen to focus our analysis on Latin America, even though many of the dynamics we discuss are likely to be broadly relevant to the future of mining in diverse regions around the world. In our view, Latin America is particularly crucial to meeting demand for critical minerals, copper, lithium, cobalt, and nickel, Given both existing levels of production and its global share of reserves of co copper, lithium, cobalt, and nickel, Chile, Peru, and Mexico hold an estimated 40% of global copper reserves, with additional reserves found in Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, and Ecuador. Roughly two-thirds of the world's global lithium reserves are in Latin America. These are primarily in Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile, although Mexico, Peru, and Brazil are home to smaller shares and host some exploration projects. The region also has sizable nickel reserves. Brazil holds 17% of global nickel reserves, with additional reserves in Colombia and Cuba, as well as small amounts of cobalt. We therefore believe that the trajectory of mining in Latin America will have an outsized impact on global commodities markets and the global energy transition. So, I'm reading that because I want you to know that it's not just me with my eye on these regions with reference to these sorts of things and their mining. This came out last year and suddenly Mexico has a fentanyl problem. Suddenly, U.S. government officials are talking about bombing Mexico and South America. Suddenly, there's a gang influx problem that we need to stomp out right now in a fentanyl crisis on the border. Suddenly, this is fast-tracking Real ID, which I talked about in my digital fence video. Suddenly, all of these things are coalescing, and suddenly, fentanyl is on everybody's lips. Everybody's talking about fentanyl. Sort of like everyone talked about opium when the U.S. government needed to invade Afghanistan and control the Middle East and significant portions of Africa. Sort of like the uh, cocaine epidemic and the crack epidemic in the, in the inner city started when the U.S. needed to in intervene in South America and Mexico before. Sort of like all of this has increased the U.S. government's power domestically and in foreign relations and is a significant marker of U.S. intervention and interference coming up. It's almost like the U.S. government is playing the same playbook that they always have, of ramping up fears of a foreign boogeyman so that they can get you on board with their next war. Man, that would be a real good reason to smash the fucking state.